Hello, and welcome to my rules explanation slash playthrough of City of the Big Shoulders. This is the rules explanation using the PowerPoint, which you can find on my website at the link in the description. And then I will also do a playthrough on Board Game Arena with some strangers. Um, so what is City of the Big Shoulders? Well, it is kind of the spiritual child of... 18xx games and Arkwright, I would say. And I can see why that would make, if you're familiar with the 18xx system or with Arkwright, that might make you a little nervous. They're fairly heavy games. Or it might make you excited. You might be like, yeah, great. Um, but if it makes you nervous, don't worry. We're going to go through the aspects of this game that are similar to 18xx games. And really, after you play this, you'll have a foundation for being able to play any 18xx game. Um, all that changes in the game are different changes in the games are different locations different rules the placement of railroads but once you have the stock thing down i think that that's the main part of 18xx games and that's the biggest hurdle and once you can clear it you're all set you can go wherever you want wherever you want and whenever you want 18xx games span all sorts of years from the 1800s AD and BC and there's one in space in the 2030s which I enjoy anyway doesn't matter we're not talking about 18xx anymore let's talk about city of the big shoulders what is the city so imagine it's Chicago 1871 right and imagine that this has happened okay because this is probably I know it's not a funny situation the Chicago fire the great Chicago fire was catastrophe um but the look on this cow's face as it stares into mrs o'leary's eyes as it kicks over that lantern and starts this fire which was exacerbated by a drought and lots of other like just dry weather all sorts of things that cow looking into her face and just being like what is I just love it. I love everything about this picture. This pig is smart and running the opposite way of the fire. This cat is turning into a Halloween cat that looks like a rat running away. And this chicken is just like, what? Um, so, Chicago fire happens. It's hard to transition from that to hundreds of dead. Um, hundreds died. Hundreds of thousands of people were left homeless. Um, and so over... What ends up happening, it's it's actually kind of a perfect storm based on when it happens, right? You've got the Industrial Revolution having sort of been going strong for a little while now. Um, you've got Chicago really coming into its own as a city of commerce and industry. And uh, lots of railroads are stopping there. You've got the meat market really growing, as we learn from Upton Sinclair later on, right? Like... There's a lot of stuff happening in Chicago. Uh, there's a lot of immigration to Chicago because um, wages are good. They need people in the factories. And then you have the factory starting to automate. So wages kind of depress. And it's we're still a couple decades away from the Great Depression, but it's 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 getting there. Right. So what happens is you get the Gilded Age Chicago where uh, buildings are being built um, industries are starting. You start to see a lot more labor exploitation, which means you start to see more labor unions. Um, Chicago is rising like a phoenix nursed by opportunistic industrialists and capitalists. And that's what this game is. This game is you trying to be one of those industrialists, one of those capitalists, trying to sort of hark in an age where you can make a lot of money and really just take advantage of sort of what's happening in Chicago at that time. I mean, the, the Chicago in general in this time is really interesting too, because you start to see people don't want the Chicago fire to happen again. Right. So you start to see more of, uh, like safety precautions with buildings, um, which is an industry in and of itself, which is very interesting. Uh, you actually get, one interesting thing is you get the first free library that was kind of given as a gift from the United Kingdom. Um, to libraries before then had kind of been for like 
upper class people before that and hadn't been free. So the Chicago Public Library is an interesting is an interesting sort of side effect, I guess. Um, great. So this is our Chicago. This is the Chicago that we'll be looking at um, over the course of about 50 years, what we play the game. Um, and probably the most important part of Chicago is going to be Haymarket Square, which is up here on the board. And it'll make available four types of raw resources. So of course, we're going to be taking resources, we're going to be manufacturing them, adding value to them. And those resources are coal, which are the black resource, livestock, which are pink, steel, which is blue, and wood, which is brown. The cost of the resource is based on how long it's been available for sale. So it's cheaper over here, $10. It's more expensive when it first becomes available for $30 a piece. And trades can happen two for one in Haymarket Square, two of the same goods traded for one. So if I had two steel, I could trade for a livestock. So that's how we can get some resources. So we've talked about the city. Let's talk about the big shoulders, the actual meat of the game. So the game is played over five decades each decade consisting of a set order of actions. And as time progresses, more resources become available as more efficient means of exploitation are developed, right? So in the first decade, uh, at each price point, we have three resources available. In the second and third decades, we'll have four resources available. In 1905, we'll have five resources. And in 1915, we'll have six resources, which is good because also at that point, we'll have companies and factories that will be running better as well. So as I mentioned, each decade is going to consist of phases, um, and the phases will be in the same order every time. Stock, building, action, operating, and cleanup, those are shown over here. So keep track of them over here. Stock, building, action, operating, and cleanup. The phases will be played either by players or by companies, and that's one of the biggest differences, I think, in the 18xx system to some other uh, games that you sort of have to wear different hats in the game. You'll either be wearing the hat of you as the industrialist and the investor or of the president of a company um, if you're the prime, like the majority shareholder. So let's talk a little bit about companies. So let's talk about the stock phase first. Um, what we can do in the stock phase, who's going to be doing the actions in the stock phase. And the stock phase will be conducted by the players. Each player on their turn will choose one action. They'll either buy a share, sell any number of shares and buy a share, start a company, sell any number of shares and start a company, or pass. Um, now you'll notice that you can, in your action, you can sell and then buy, or sell and then start, but you can't buy a share and then sell on your, your turn. So let's say we have a three player game. Let's say we have me, Kevin and Sean. And let's say that uh, I go first, right? I buy a share and then Kevin starts a company and then Sean buys a share and then it comes back to me again. So now I could sell, right? But I couldn't buy a share and then sell and then have it be Kevin's turn. Excellent. So we need to address something at this point, I think. And what that is, is what is a company? So a company is a publicly listed entity which is going to turn resources into some sort of manufactured good that they can sell for a profit. We have four types of companies in the game. We have dry goods companies, we have shoes, we have meat packing, and we have food and dairy. I don't know why it's food and dairy both. Um, you'd think that dairy would be a part of food. So you have these four types of companies that'll have some amount of demand associated with them. And these companies will use their factories to make goods that they can sell, again, hopefully for a profit. So let's take a look at what the publicly, the public entity, sort of publicly listed aspect of it means. Each company is going to have seven stock certificates that will equal 10 shares. So they'll have five certificates that are common certificates that are 10% each of the company. 
a preferred certificate, which is 20%, and a president's certificate, which is 30% of the company. The president's certificate will always be with the player who owns the most shares in a company. And the most you can own within a company is 60%. You can't own 70 or 80 or 100% of a company. So let's say that I own 30% of a company, but Kevin owns 50% of the company. Kevin will have the 30% share as well as either the 20% or two 10%. And I would have either three 10% or a 10 and 20% because I wouldn't have the president's certificate because I only have 30%. Kevin has 50%. Um, the president is going to be the one who makes decisions for how the company is run. They and any other shareholders will receive the benefits for the stocks that they own. They'll receive payout from the dividends based on the goods that are sold based on demand. So you might be wondering, what is the point of having a 20% preferred certificate, right? Well, based on the player count, you're going to have different certificate limits. So you can only own so many certificates. So if you own a preferred certificate, that one certificate is better than two 10% certificates. If you're going to own 20% of a company, owning the preferred certificate is a fine way to go. So that's what the publicly listed aspect means. So we have 10 companies available in the game. We've got four dry good companies. We've got two shoe companies, two meat packing companies, and two food and dairy companies. And they, you'll choose one. Let's say you want to start a company, right? You'll choose one of this, these certificates. They're not certificates. These are charters. You'll take a charter and then you'll prepare to birth the company. So you choose the charter for the company that hasn't been started yet. You can't start a company someone else has started. And you'll choose a starting share value for that company. Now on our share track over here under the calendar, we've got four of our values are sort of shaded darker than the other ones. These are the four values that you can start your company at. You can start it at 35, 45, nope, 35, 40, 50, or 60. Now, when you start a company, you'll become the president. A, a company that has been started always needs a president. It cannot go presidentless. So if you're starting a company, you, congratulations, are that company's president, which means you need to have the 30% president share certificate, which means you need to spend three times the value of the share price that you've set up for the company. So let's say you set up the company to start at $40 a share. You'll need to pay $120 into the company's treasury, and then you'll take the president's certificate. Um, if you start at 35, it's 105. If you start at 50, it's 150, and 60 is 180. Um, typically, you can only buy one share at a time in the game. Um, the exception being starting a company, right? Because then you get the 30% certificate and buying the preferred share. So let's talk a little bit about buying other stocks, right? Um, once a company has been started, anyone can buy any shares that are unowned by players. The money will be paid directly to the company the first time the stock is purchased based on the current stock price. So in this case, these are our seven certificates for this company, right? They just got bought. They were part at 35. So each individual share, each common share is worth $35. The preferred share is worth $70. And the president's share is $105 because it's 30% of the company. So once the company has been started, like I said, anyone can buy shares in the company. It's not just yours um, or the president's. So the um, you would either, if you're buying a share, you would either spend $35 to get one common certificate, or you could spend $70 to get the preferred certificate. And the, the difference is going to be when you buy on your turn, you can only buy one certificate. So the only way you can buy more than one share in a go is to buy the preferred share. So that's how we buy stocks uh, when they're coming from the company, right? So when the company first starts, it has all their stocks on it. Any stocks it sells, that money goes into the treasury. So this company has 105 because it just started and whoever is the president paid 105 into the treasury. We can also sell stocks. 
So when we sell a company, as long as we are not the president of the company, we can sell to the bank pool any number of our stocks in that company for the current share price. So we'll look at the shares and we'll say, okay, if it's currently worth $100, I sell one of them, I get $100. And then the share price marker moves down one space because I sold one share. If I sell three shares, I would get $300 and the price the value will go down to 50 because it'll go down one space per share sold. Now, these are the advanced rules uh, in the game. I am not teaching you the basic game. If you want to do that, you can look at the rule book. Um, I don't feel like the advanced game is that inaccessible. So this is, that's what we're doing. In the basic game, no matter how many sell, shares you sell, the price doesn't go down. It goes down by one. But it doesn't go down. If you sell three, it goes down by one instead of three by three. Okay, so then those shares are going to go into the bank pool, which means the bank is the one giving you the money for the shares. And if they're in the bank pool, the company doesn't own them, right? Because the company originally sold them to you, and then you sold them to the bank. So now the bank owns them. Now, if you are the president of a company, you can only sell down to 30%. Right. Because there always needs to be a president of the company. So if Kevin owns 10 percent and I own 30 percent because I'm the president, I can't sell any of my shares. If Kevin owns 10 percent and I own 40 percent, I can sell one of my shares because I'll that'll bring me down to 30 percent. Right now, if another player owns 30, at least 30 percent, they'll become the president if you sell below 30 percent. So let's say Kevin owns 30 percent and I own 50 percent. If I sell below 30%, Kevin becomes the president. So Kevin's got 30, I've got 50. If I sell one, right, I'm at 40, he's at 30, I'm still president. If I sell two, I'm at 30, he's at 30, I'm still president. Because even if we have the same amount, president will stay with who they know, right? The company will stay with who they know. But if I sell three, I'm at 20, Kevin's at 30, Kevin gets the presidency of the company. Um... So I would exchange my president certificates for three shares so that I can break it and then sell to your heart's content. Great. So we know that we can sell our shares. We know we can buy shares from the company and put the money in the company. What happens if we want to buy shares from the bank pool? Well, we would pay the current stock price to the bank, not to the company. The company was already compensated for the share. They're not going to be compensated for it again. Excellent. All right. So, oops, a doodle. The last option you have during your stock phase is to pass. The phase does not end until all players have passed consecutively. So it's possible to pass one turn and then jump back in the next. So let's say again that I'm playing with Kevin and Sean, right? So I pass. Kevin buys a stock. Sean buys a stock. It's my turn again. I can I can do something. I'm not out because I passed. It's not a perma pass, right? So we could say Kevin buys something. Sean buys something. I buy something. Kevin passes. Sean passes. I pass. Once all the players have passed consecutively, the stock phase is over. We're going to move on. And priority deal will go to the player to the left of the player who bought or sold stock last. So in this case, right, we had Kevin bought, Sean bought, I bought, Kevin passed, uh, Sean passed, I passed. Since I was the last one to buy, Kevin would become priority deal for the next stock round, which means he would get to go first in buying and selling in the next stock round uh, or starting companies. It's not a bad place to be. So let's compare uh, what you can do versus what the company can do so far. So you can buy and sell stocks in any companies, being mindful of presidential limitations, and you can start a company by setting a stock value and paying three times that value. A company will receive any fund paid by, for a share the first time a share is sold and is controlled by the player with the most shares. Great. Pretty straightforward, I think. Now, before we move on, let's talk a little bit about how factories work now that we're a little clearer about companies. So factories are where the workers will give additional value to goods through their labor. Each company can run two factories. 
One of them has three factories, actually, I think. At least two factories. And each factory will produce a certain number of goods. So this is a factory right here. And this is a factory. These are our two factories. They'll produce a certain number of goods. So this factory produces one good. And this factory produces one good. Each factory is a set number of workers it needs to run. This factory is one worker. This factory is three workers. If it has fewer workers than the number needed, it will not run. So at this point, neither of these factories will run because there's no workers in it. If we had a worker here and a worker here, this factory would run. This one wouldn't because this one needs three workers to run. Each factory needs certain resources, which is what it'll turn into its goods. If the company cannot provide these resources, the factory will not run. So this factory needs two wood and a steel, and this factory needs three wood and a coal. Now, companies will produce their goods, and then they will sell them to meet demand for that particular type of good. So we've got our food, we've got our dry goods, we've got our meat packing, and we've got our shoes. Great. So factories will also be places where we will employ workers, salespeople, and managers. So let's talk a little bit more about how we're going to get those people to work in our uh, companies and other ways that we can boost our companies. So the building phase. The building phase is conducted by the players. It's not conducted by the companies. Each player has three building tiles at the beginning of the round, beginning of the decade, and will choose one to build, one to discard, and one to keep for future decades. So at the beginning of the decade, you'll get two new building cards because you'll have one that you kept from the previous decade and then two to replace the one that you built and the one that you discarded. Players will decide secretly and simultaneously then reveal at the same time and place their buildings in their player row in the current decades column. So this is the first decade, right? That we're choosing a building for. Choose one of these buildings. Let's say we choose the salesperson training facility and let's say we're playing yellow. So we would put that right here. And then workers are added to the job market if they're pictured here at the bottom of the building tile. So we've got a pretty shallow pool here, right? These workers are pretty expensive, but we're adding, if we had this guy, we're adding at least one worker here that costs $30 to hire. So that's fun. All right. So let's talk a little bit more about you versus the company, right? So we know now that we will choose buildings to build in the city and the company will produce and sell goods. So those are some more differences. So let's look as promised a little closer at the action phase. So the action phase is conducted by the players and the companies. Each player has a number of partners they will use to activate uh, actions on behalf of their companies or themselves. Each player starts the game with two partners, but can and should get more as the game goes on. Let's talk about how we can get those more. Get those more partners. <laughs> it's this, that's a sentence that's definitely not a mess. So... Additional, the, there's three additional partners you can get during the game. You can get it, you can get one by operating all of the factories in the company you started the game with. So in this case, if I started the game with this factory and I ran both of these factories, this little drawing here is the partner symbol. So I would get a partner at that point. You can get a partner by reaching the gain a partner space on the appeal track. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. Or at the beginning of the third decade, you'll get your third partner. You'll get another partner. So everyone should, everyone will end the game with at least three partners, but hopefully you'll have more because they allow you to do more things. Your partners activating action spaces move money through the city's economy. And the direction of the money's movement will be shown by these sort of pictures uh, on each space. Each space will tell you who is paying whom. Paying money to whom? Yeah, paying whom? It doesn't matter. So the way that money can move is from a company to a player, from a company to its shareholders, from a company to the bank, from the bank to a player, and from the bank to a company. So this is our symbol for a bank. So this is bank to a company. 
This is company, this is shareholders, multiple top hats. So company is giving money to shareholders. Company is paying the bank. This one, the bank is playing one player and that player is the player whose row the building is in. Um, same here. This is company gives money to this guy. This is company gives money to this guy. Um, those are the options. Excellent. So movement is indicated by symbols on the action spaces, the movement of money. So first, let's talk about hiring workers at the job market. Now, this symbol, this infinity symbol means as many partners can go here as y'all want. It doesn't, there's no limit how many partners. The company will pay the bank. You'll choose one, your company, who's activating this. That company will pay the bank for each worker. We have to assume the money goes to the worker, otherwise it's depressing, right? So if this company wanted to hire enough workers to run both of its factories, it would need to hire three workers, one here and two here. So it could pay 30, 30, 30. So it would pay $90 to fill their factories with workers. Now, as long as the factory has raw materials, it'll produce five goods during operation. This factory produces two, this one produces three. So as long as we end up with three coal, two livestock and one wood, we'll end up with five goods. Cool. Now we can also automate our factories using this action, the gear. So in this one, you'll put your partner here. The company will pay this player $40 and then they'll choose which factory they want to automate. So in this case, they only have one factory that's got a worker in. You can't automate where there's no worker, right? You need to have a worker to replace with automation. So you take this uh, automaton, move it to this space, which frees up this worker who we can now put in this factory. Now, when we move the automaton from this space, you'll notice it reveals another good symbol. So now this factory, because it's completely automated, is running at peak efficiency. So it'll increase its production by one. So now this factory produces three goods instead of two. This space is the company will pay the bank $70 to hire a salesperson. Salespeople will go over here on this part of the board and they'll affect the cost per good of what your company makes. So when this company produces, each good they produce is worth $30. With the first salesperson, the goods are worth $40. And with a second salesperson, the goods are worth $50. And you'll fill the salespeople top to bottom. So you can't go to 50 first. That's, that's, that's very cheating. We can also go to this space and hire a managers, right? So company pays the bank $60 and we get a manager. The manager is specific to a factory and they'll provide a bonus when that factory runs. So the bonus might be to gain resources from Haymarket, which are these cubes. It might be to produce another good, which is this octagonal prism, right? Or it might be to advance on the appeal track, which are these stars, and which we will talk about shortly. So that's what managers do. Now, uh, let's talk about assets. A partner can go to this space, and again, as many players as want can go to this space. This one doesn't have the infinity symbol, so only one partner can go here per decade. This one's got the infinity, as many can go there as y'all want. Um, you can acquire assets in this space. So you acquire the assets down here from the south part of Chicago. The company will pay the cost of the asset, which is listed above, and then place the asset in an available space on their charter. So the cost is listed above the asset, after paying for the asset, the customer, the co I always say that, the company will immediately receive the bonus in the lower right hand corner. So in this case, all of them have the same bonus. It's a free automate action. Um, they might have a free hire action, which would be shown with this pawn symbol, which means a worker, or increase appeal, which is our star, our blue star. So this company um, probably would want to have a worker before they get an asset because they're all automated. 
would pay an amount of money. Let's see. They need to fully run their factories. They need three steel and two livestock. So let's say they spend $50 for this uh, like smokehouse. I don't know what it is. Um, so they take this tile. They get a free automate. So if they had a worker, they could automate. And then this tile will go in this asset space. And once per decade, they can activate it. They can exhaust it spend the money at the top and get what's printed on it so they could exhaust this for two livestock and then all they'd have to worry about is getting steel later on in the round which is pretty neat now if a company does not have a space for an asset they can still spend the money here for this and take the bo the benefit at the bottom which might be cheaper like maybe if you really need an automate action or if you want to hire someone but everybody costs 50 dollars right now um it gives you some options. It's not it's not optimal though. So let's think about that. Now we can go to this space. This is another infinity space. And this is the company pays out to shareholders. So the company is going to pay dividends. And in order to go to the space, the company needs to have a hundred dollars because they're going to pay out a hundred dollars in dividends from their treasury. So this is a legal way of moving money from a company's treasury to the shareholders. Because spoiler alert, at the end of the game, the amount of money in the company's treasury does not matter. It only matters how much money you as an industrialist were able to take out of the company or to make from the company. So you can go to this action to distribute that $100 amongst the shareholders. So it'd be $10 per share paid out to the shareholders. So if I was at 50%, and Kevin was at 30, I would get $50, Kevin would get 30, and the company still owns the other two shares, so it would just keep that last $20. Now, this will potentially increase your share value. Uh-oh, what? Well, let's talk a little bit about increasing share value, stock value. I use share and stock interchangeably in this, and I apologize. So, depending on where your company's value marker is, when you pay dividends, the value will potentially increase by one, two, or three spaces. So in this case, let's look at uh, AA here. Let's look at Anglo-American. So the dividend D is 100, because we know that. We went to that space to pay out 100. The current value is 160. So if 160 is greater than 100, which it is, no increase occurs. Okay. So your stock value is only going to increase if you manage to make more than the stock is worth at the time. So let's say these two. These two are worth 80. So our 80 is greater than 100? No. So we can move on to the next one. Two times our stock value, 160, is greater than 100, is greater than or equal to 80. That's true. So we can increase by one. So those values will go up to 100. Not bad. Now what about over here? So if three times our stock value, our current value, so three times 35 is 105, 105 is greater than 100, is greater than or equal to 70, increase by two. So if this one paid dividends, they'd go up to 50, they'd increase by two. Now, if the dividends paid out are greater than or equal to three times the current value of the stock, and the current value of the stock is above this line, is worth more than 50, then you can triple jump. So for these to triple jump, you need to be above this line, check, and your dividend needs to be uh, greater than or equal to $240 paid out. This one to triple jump, 48. So it needs to be greater than or equal to $480 to triple jump. This one can't triple jump because it's behind this line. Once it hits 60, it can triple jump though. So that's how we increase stock value, which we'll do whenever we pay out dividends, either by taking this action or when we make a profit during the operating round. This, let's say that your company's treasury is looking a little low, right? And you're going to need money to buy resources during the operating round so you can run your factories to make money. You can go to this space and the bank will pay the company $40. So that's, that's always an option. Your company won't go bankrupt, which is nice because that can happen in some games. So let's talk a little bit about appeal. We've mentioned it a little with the blue stars. 
And it's your company's notoriety. Any action you take which provides numbers and blue stars will improve your company's appeal. You can't lose appeal in this game, which is good. So each company's charter has a number one to three in a blue star in the upper corner. And that's going to dictate where that company will start on the appeal track. Now, if your company like this one starts on three, this one starts on three, this little piggy starts on three, uh, you don't get this benefit. You'll only get the bonus if your company advances to that space. So this company doesn't start with this bonus. Um, but the rest of them start where they start. Now you can go to this space. Again, infinite numbers of partners can go here to increase one of your company's appeal by one space. That company pays the bank $20. They move their marker and they gain any bonuses they activate. Now the player who does this gets to move to first uh, player. So this is our turn order. We do green, blue, red. Now let's say green, I don't know, bought an asset. Blue took some resources. Red is going here. So red is going to go to be first player. Now what's interesting about this is it's going to affect this decade, not next decade. So now red gets to go again because we're circling back to the beginning of the turn order. So now it's red, green, blue. Wonderful. Let's talk about those bonuses. So the bonuses in order of when they're triggered, we have a free worker, a free salesperson, a free automaton. We get an extra partner, right? We get potentially our third, fourth, or fifth partner. This is like a little chit that you'll put on one of your factories. One of the company, the company that gets here will take an extra good shit and put it on their factory to show that factory is more efficient now they're more productive they produce one extra good and then this symbol means that company's stock value advances by one um and those are repeated again down here so that is appeal So let's talk about the operating phase, which we kind of talked about a little in terms of kind of talked about it a little in terms of how factories work, but let's look at it in detail. So the operating phase is going to be conducted by the companies. So what might help is um, you're always going to want to keep your personal money separate from the company's money. The company's money in the treasury should always be on the company's charter. And that's a really good habit to get into, especially if you're going to get into playing 18xx games, um, is you've got to separate those physically and mentally in your head, like cognitively. you got to keep them separate. So in the operating phase, each company will buy resources, run factories, distribute goods, pay dividends, and withhold profits in descending appeal order. So whoever has the most appeal gets to go first because their goods are in the most demand. So they get to go first. It's nice. It's nice to be notorious, I guess. All right. Now remember that your company needs to have resources to run its factories, right? Not only does it need to have workers in, but it needs to have resources to make into things. If your company won't have the money to purchase resources, they need to emergency fundraise, which is selling one of the stocks that they still have that nobody has bought yet. So to do that, they can sell any number of them for the current share value. So let's say this company is selling one stock. They would get $160 into the treasury, but their value would go down by one. And one of their shares is now in the bank pool. You can sell as many as you'd like. They could sell three of them if they wanted to um, for $480, but it'll go down. Their value will go down by three spaces. So, I mean, looking at it too, if you know how much you're going to be able to produce and if there's a difference between, let's say you're going to make $300, right? Um, if you sell a share from here and get down to 100 you'll get $120 in the bank, right? And, or in the treasury. And when you sell for $300, you'll triple jump anyway. 
So you'll get to the same place that you would have double jumping, making from $300, making $300. So I don't know. You got to think about stuff like that, I guess. I don't always, but it's not the worst thing to do. Um, company stock value decrease one step per share sold, like we talked about as well. Um, so you're going to be buying resources from up here, from the hay market. So once you've decided if you're going to emergency fundraise or not, you're going to purchase as many goods as you would like to from the market. Goods here cannot be purchased. They can only be traded for. Goods here cannot be purchased. That's sort of the predictions of what is going to come out next. Companies can store as many goods as they want on their charter and they don't go bad from decade to decade. So this company can only run this factory. They can't run this one because they only have one worker. So they have three coal, so they're good for coal. They just need a livestock. So they could spend $20 and take this livestock. Wonderful. Now they can also buy goods that they might not be able to use, which is a useful tactic for trading to Haymarket Square. So let's look at a potential example of this. Let's say that this company had workers in all of its factories. So it had a worker in the first factory and two workers in the second factory. To run both of them, this company would need three coal, two livestock, and one wood. Well, they have three coal, which is great. So now they just need to buy two livestock and a wood. They can get the wood for $10. Great, so they'll do that. And they can get the livestock, one of the livestocks, for $20, right? For this one here. So they'll buy that. Now, for a second livestock, they could either spend the $30 to buy this livestock here, or they could buy these two steel for $10 each and trade them for the two for one for a livestock up here. And you can trade as long as there are goods in the market to trade for. So they could do that, and that would only cost them $20 instead of the $30 of buying from over here. So something to keep in mind. Now, once you have finished buying resources, the company will then produce goods that in each factory that is fully manned. Um, and any resources used will be returned to Haymarket Square. Any managers employed in factories will produce their bonuses as well. So we've produced goods. Let's say here we ran this factory. So we produced two goods plus this third bonus because we're fully automated. And then we will sell in the meatpacking district. We'll sell goods to meet the demand. So what does that mean? Well, let's work through it. We will calculate the profit by adding the value of each good plus any demand card completion bonuses. So remember, we have three goods, so we can sell here, here, and here. So we'll finish both of these demand cards. So we'll get both of the bonuses, 50 plus 20 is 70. Each of our goods sells for $40 because we have one salesperson and we sold three goods, so that's 120. So 120 plus 70 is 190. We'll be paying out, we'll, we'll, we'll make $190. Then we have to decide what do we want to do with this $190. We can either pay out dividends or we can withhold. If we pay out dividends, we'll pay 10% of what we made per each share. So $19 per share, not per certificate. So if I'm the president and I own 30% of the company, I would get 19 times three, 38, but it's 57. I would get $57. Let's say Kevin owns one share, he gets $19. And let's say Sean owns two shares, he gets $38. And then the company will get the rest if they still have the shares on their charter. Now, if they don't have them, then, and they're in the bank pool, the bank just keeps that money. It doesn't pay it out to anybody or anything. So that's paying out dividends. Now you can also withhold your profit. If you withhold it, it'll go into the treasury of the company. So the entirety of what you make, all $190 will go into the treasury of the company. But your stock value will go back 
one space because the shareholders are mad, right? They're like, why didn't you pay us? Why did we give you money if you're not going to give us any sort of benefit from it? So depending on how much you pay out, how much your dividend is and how much your current value is, remember that'll affect how much your stock value increases either by zero, one, two, or three spaces, or you'll go back if you don't pay out at all, if you withhold. Wonderful. So let's talk about our last action, cleanup. So cleanup, you'll remove all of the goods from the rightmost square in Haymarket, and you'll remove the asset tile from the rightmost space in uh, the asset market down here. And then you'll refill the market. So you'll move everything down over one, and then you'll refill based on the decade. So remember either four or five or six, um, and then down here, you'll slide over and then you'll refill from here, uh, sliding after. This one's a little more complicated. You'll remove any completed demand cards from the board and slide the other cards to the right and then add new cards. So we see that these three have been completed, right? So we will slide, I don't know how that guy, that guy shouldn't, that guy shouldn't be there. He should look like that. Anyway. We remove these because they're completed, and then we slide these two over, ploop, and we slide these two over, and we slide these two over, ploop, and, oh, I think this was taken, oh, I know why, I took the screenshot after somebody sold a bunch of pig stuff. So, we have a new demand space available because we don't have any more demand cards possible. Uh, you can sell goods as many as you like there's the infinity sign for half their value we're getting close at this point we're getting close to the depression people there isn't as much demand for goods um things are terrible for people all over so we go from there uh and that's when you kind of get a feeling that the game is going to end soon so let's talk a little bit about winning um you're always going to look you win as a player not as a company remember that you win as a player. So one thing that we'll have in the game as well is public goals. There'll be five public goals per game out of the 10 that are possible, and they'll be scored at the end of the game. And they're for majorities. So this one is $200 to the person with the most managers in their companies that they're presidents of. Uh, same with salespeople, same with assets in their company, same with workers in company, and same with uh, automatons in companies. Um, these three, these two are also company related. If you are the president of the company with the highest appeal, you get $200. If you're the president with of the company with the most money in their treasury, you get $200. These are based on people, players. This is $200 if you're the player with the most partners. This is $200 if you're the player with the most common certificates. And this is $200 if you're the player with the most preferred certificates. Now, what if there's a tie? If there's a tie, both players receive the bonus, which is lovely. It's a lovely thing to do. So how do we win? In-game calculation. To calculate your final value, you'll just add together all your cash on hand. Don't factor in your companies. The value of your stocks and any bonuses that you achieved. And the winner will be worth the most at the end of the game. So that is the rules explanation. We'll go ahead and move to Board Game Arena and try to cobble together a game with some strangers and see how it works.